Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Bench Den Podcast. Uh, John is on vacation. I know we teased that he was going to be taking over, and that is, in fact, the case. Uh, but today, you're stuck back with me as he is at his sister's wedding. So, John, hope you enjoyed it. Congratulations uh, to your sister. I'm joined today by a very familiar face, uh, Chuck Harris, president and owner of Benchmark Tool and Supply. Welcome. Good morning, Mike. Yeah, Glad to be here. Uh, I know you got a busy schedule, so thank you for taking some time out. Um, certainly appreciate it. Uh, so today we're going to dive into the history of Benchmark. It's kind of a series I wanted to get season two started off with. Um, you've seen us talk about products. You have seen us sort of bring some other guests on and talk about their experience. But for those who may not know or may be new to it, I wanted to start season two off with the history of Benchmark and get Chuck in here. Um, we'll have Kelly Dalton come in here, who's our director of operations, who's been with you for quite some time and has helped grow the company. Um, so I wanted to get their perspectives and just tell their story of Benchmark Tool and Supply, how it got started, why we do what we do, and kind of where we've come from and where we're going to go. I don't know if I need to get you benched in or not, Chuck. I feel like... Uh, um, yeah, I'll have to uh, dig deep. It's been been a number of years, but uh, I think we can put this together and make it, make it uh, simple for folks to understand. Okay, uh, fair enough. I guess prior to Benchmark... Uh, my background was focused on electronic engineering. Mm -hmm. uh, my first stab at this this type of technology in the industries it focuses on was uh, uh, a now a competitor of ours that has changed uh, ownership multiple times. But I was able to learn at that point what was classified as two D machine automation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a great great run. Enjoyed it. Uh, and really seeing, you know, looking further down the road, bigger picture stuff, I seen the uh, 3D opportunity arising, and it was it's just extremely exciting. But I knew I had to learn multiple pieces at that point. There was, uh, you know, a, a piece uh, for the 3D modeling, which was AutoCAD based. Mm -hmm. and I really had a had a drive and a passion to learn. And then the positioning piece, which was uh, robotic or and or GPS component. Uh, all this stuff was just starting to emerge and come together. It was really exciting, scary at the same time. Yeah. It was a, it was a huge learning curve. It was uh, at that point in time, you did not have portals to go to for right. self-education. Not not many YouTube videos out <laughs> there to, to jump on and sure. get you out of a jam. Uh, so a transition to a company that was primarily focused on AutoCAD software mm -hmm. for engineering firms and surveying equipment, which at that time was uh, really the only piece we had real time was robotics. Sure. Um, so the the first uh, the first products that were released to do three D grading applications was, was robotic control. Okay. So it's very limited, you know, in what you could do. Uh, the cost to, to enter was pretty high at that point, but it was still mandatory to learn the the three D modeling and all about traditional surveying. It really, uh, I knew that would help propel the business as this uh, as technologies emerged. So, I went to this company, and we we brought on a team of, of really good people to to focus on the machine side of it. While we were learning more about design and three D modeling and uh, robotic equipment, and I can remember working you know long hours. We would literally be on a site utilizing computers that you could source locally from whether it be Best Buy or Office Max or wherever. Circuit City. And, and, a, and a programmer on site in sure. an RV. And oh. we were we were in, literally integrating and designing 3D systems on the fly. Wow. Uh, and, and then at night in the hotels, we were, you know, pull out our computer with AutoCAD, land desktop at that time, and build models <sighs> or revise models to, to try to make this technology work the next day. I mean – you know, just off-the-shelf cabling and sure. you know, stuff was not built to ride on heavy machinery, but, uh, yeah. you know, you had to start somewhere. And really, it, it you know, it, it felt like years, but within months, we had systems running, and it was producing unbelievable results for the contractors we were serving. So we, we knew that, you know, this this type technology serving these markets was, was long-lived and sure. poised to grow exponentially. So. Um, that happened to be a second generation company. Uh, the, the ownership at that time really did ha didn't have a desire to grow that business. So 
it, it brought about an opportunity to start a new company. Sure. Uh, and at that time, I'd, I'd interface personally with all the manufacturers and, and had relationships and never really thought about starting a business until, you know, this day in 2004 happened. And sure. Like, okay, here, here's, here's an opportunity. And then just started reaching out to advisors and, and mentors and putting a business plan together and, you know, getting with legal counsel and, Mm -hmm. you know, getting all this guidance. And I'd, I'd been in the field for quite a while at this point, so I had a good idea of what kind of revenue we could generate year one. Sure. So in the business plan, put all that together and you know, made a trip to a an accountant's office and, of course, you know, got scared to death after that <laughs> power meeting. They were telling me, you know, how, how long we'd have to live with no no income. And yeah. It, it was uh, as exciting and depressing at the same time, so just scared to death. And they, they slashed my first year forecast uh, by two thirds. Oh. I'm like, wow, okay. So we'll 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 take that and run with it. Sure. And and a actually, after the first year benchmark, we were within one percent of that first year wow. forecast that we had originally. Oh, so the two thirds cut was uh, out the window. Was, it was not needed, but wow. And really, that was in '04. So we were we were off to the races, and up until you know 2008 hits. Yep. So. You're starting a business. There's no way you're going to come out of the gate with all the right people in the right seats, doing all the right things. Sure, it, it's a. Uh, I was I was never uh, I'm sort of entrepreneur at heart, but I, I certainly did not have all the pieces together uh, with just my skill set to make it happen. So I, I really focused on building a great team of people. Sure. So we had a great team from 2004 to 2007, eight ish, but they were not necessarily in the right seats to mm -hmm. really be efficient. So the 2008 recession hits and it, it really, you know, was a, a hard lick to the construction industry. Absolutely. Um, so we learned a lot and it gave us time to really focus on getting more efficient internally. So, you know, it's both exciting and emotionally challenging having to move team members around, including myself. So it's, it was, uh, you know, looking back on it, it was mandatory, but at that time, you know, you always worry if you're making the right decisions or sure. not. So um, we, we, we made these changes internally within the structure and, uh, you know, continued adding numerous vendors to our product basket to, to start diversifying. Uh, we started diversifying, I'd say, 2009. But during this recession, 08, 09, which it felt like it lasted, 10 years uh, uh i think we're fortunate to be in the area uh, of the u.s we're in the economy here's always been fairly stable yeah but the 08 recession was noticeable i'm not going to discount that we were involved in some major infrastructure pro projects that were mm -hmm. underway that were going to continue uh, so that really helped us sure. uh, stay active in the industry and supply technologies and, and consumables to these companies uh also, during that time period, the, the smaller customers we work with to, to introduce them to technology really started leaning on technology because they knew during a downturn they had to try to reduce the overhead as much as possible but remain efficient. Yeah. So, oddly enough, it was kind of backwards of what we forecasted. All of our commodity-type products we sold into the markets really stopped selling. But the emerging technologies ramped up. So we our overall revenue grew during the recession, but it was a different product makeup. Yep. So our most expensive ticket items were the most active during the 08 to 2010 range, which is really, really wild to look back on. And, it really yeah. speaks to the importance of the technology that, that we're into, I mean, in my opinion. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's just there's a very clear, visible return on investment. Once you're... You understand the technology. If you implement it correctly, there is no arguing the fact that it it helps with your efficiency. So, we've we've continued to diversify. I say that a lot, but you know the core products, the core sensor types we use, they have multiple applications across many industries. Mm -hmm. So it, it's you know with construction, you know it's the least automated industry in the world. And, and still is today. There's been, you know, I think we're on the cusp of mass market adoption. We're mm -hmm. seeing that today 
with with all our technologies. But uh, there's other industries out there that really are having to lean on technology to bridge the uh, labor issue gap. For sure. Um, we're not going to solve all the problems in the world with technology, but we can certainly leverage what companies have in good people in their time and increase their efficiency. So it's uh, it's still it's, it's exciting that we have unlimited growth potential, but also challenging because mm-hmm. I mean we have to we have to have the proper team members as well. Right. Yeah. I mean, and that's a, a oh, you talk about the proper team members. I mean, that's that's so key to not only us but also our customers too. I mean, going on into technology, it's this is something that you everybody can pick up. But it takes some time to learn. So, I mean, that's an important lesson, in my opinion, too, for our customers, having the right people who have the right mindset, have the right attitude to accept the new technology and don't want to say, well, I've done it this way my whole life. I don't need your system. And, and that may work for some people, but you've got to have the mindset to take that technology and learn. Uh, it, it's, I know I learn every day. And so, I mean, to, for customers to take that, to have that mindset to learn and put them in the right seat, I think is extremely important. I agree. I mean, we, we've recently brought on some uh, you know, emerging technologies that that fall right into the current customer base that we cater to. So a lot of folks that have invested in some of the other technologies, we've, we've got new things that can further improve their efficiencies, reduce cost. And I, and I tell our sales teams today, our, our really our only competitor today is the time it's going to take us to educate customers on what this new stuff will do we yeah. can't get to everybody fast enough to to do it justice so i mean we've, we've got our struggles in doing so for sure so benchmark got started in 2004 um, when you decided to take the leap of faith and scared to death you said um, but you had relationships with existing vendors um, why did you decide to move forward carrying topcon um, survey and, and machine control products well, I mean, really, in, in you know, business opportunities are, are time sensitive. Mm-hmm. Um, so a lot of times it's a, it's a combination of willingness to start a business, the opportunity to, say, carry a certain product or provide a certain service. And, and at that time, TopCon uh, had, had moved into the 3D machine control world. Mm-hmm. It was just getting started, uh, which it seems like it's been an eternity, but it was just back in 2004 when this stuff first uh, really made it mainstream or started making it mainstream. Um, We had conversations and and TopCon released the first integrated GPS receiver where the radio, GPS receiver, and antenna was all in one Mm -hmm. with a power source on board. And at the same time, had technology to track not only the GPS satellite constellations, but GLONASS, the Russian. So uh, no, no other manufacturer in the industry had this option. So they were really, you were really coming up right along with TopCon. So they, they were kind of mirroring, you guys were mirroring each other. So you really shared the same mindset with them and what they were doing. We did. It's, it's having a having a clearly visible uh, competitive advantage in the marketplace, reliable products at a uh, at a great market price. It, allow, it allowed us to start our business and come out of the gate and really expand quickly. That's awesome. It's almost like, uh, not to be cheesy, but a match made in heaven. I mean, they were marrying what you guys are doing. The price point was right for everybody, and the technology was advancing at your speed. It, it, it was. Cool. So let's talk about, I mean, if you've been in our showroom here in Raleigh, you'll notice, you know, we've got a lot of plaques from TopCon starting in 2008. Uh, this is going to be a bit of a brag session, but I wanted to bring it out because it, it really is impressive. I mean, within four years from 2004 to 2008, while we were going to business, you know, it, I'm sure we had a couple first year struggles for second year, but starting in 2008, up until, you know, almost every year since, we've been a recognized top top five off top con dealer, top seller in the region. What was that like to see, you know, going from, man, I don't know if I can start this business to work in those four years to, man, having my sales success recognized and being a top, you know, a recognized top dealer for top con? Well, personally, I had to give all the credit to the team of people we put together. Yeah. I mean, there's, it's not not a one man kind of business sure. here. It takes it takes uh, it takes a lot of people to make it happen. So having a solid product lineup is one one ingredient. But again, the team of people from our sales staff to service to training, support, administrative, marketing it all it all had to come together to make that happen. Yeah. And, you know, the evolution of a business, you know, when you're 
at a certain size, you can accomplish certain things with certain skill sets. But as you grow, it, it, it tends to change a bit. So if you, if you do not change with it, you will not be able to keep that up. So, I mean, our company today is obviously a lot different than it was in 2008 uh, with – the core piece that's driving change is you know, we're continuing to have to get higher caliber team members mm-hmm. uh, because there's, there's a lot of pressure on us. When we deliver technology, we have to be able to implement it, make it work for folks. And it's, uh, it's just been extremely exciting, humbling at the same point time. It, it's just the team. I, I give all the credit to the sure. team. I mean, there's one person can do a certain amount. <clears throat> but your capacity is is really short lived if you don't uh, employ the right team. Yeah, I, I I don't think the true words have ever been said. I mean, it it really is a team effort, and I I couldn't agree more. Um, I think you've kind of hit on it, but maybe we'll just ask this. You know, obviously from two thousand four to now, I mean, the construction industry has changed. What are some of the biggest changes that you've seen within the survey and construction industry? Well, one of the big ones is I mentioned it in one of our conversations, but the uh, adoption rate. Yeah. It seems like in construction with technology, the early adopter phase was, it, it lasted for, you know, 15 to 20 years here because we're, we're just now encroaching on the, the mass adoption. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there are several factors of that. The cost of ownership, the cost sure. to enter, yep. to, to implement technology has, has come down. There's There's more channels to acquire it now. Just got to be careful that you're, you know, make sure you choose, you know, a channel that's going to be able to support training in all long term. Sure. Um, there's several different variations of technologies now. So uh, I think with with the market starting to understand that, okay, this is real. It's, it's a big market. We got to do something. It's really driving the uh, – the, uh, I'm trying to think here the, – the, the visibility – that this stuff's out here and it works, so yep. we need to adopt it you know, in some flavor. Sure. Um, so we have seen that change, and it's just it's, it's exciting because now we're seeing the technology drive other decisions in these companies. So, yeah. um, you know, where technology was an afterthought 10, 10 years ago. Sure, absolutely. Now we're thinking about, okay, how does this other – implement work with the technology we've chosen to use so it's it's, it's a big change yeah fair it's almost like uh i mean word of mouth was easy for you know haircuts or car sales but as far as construction technology not a lot of people knew it so that yeah. word of mouth took a while to spread yeah it's i mean it, it certainly helped people over the years but now it's it's a fact that if you do not have it and implement it correctly you will not be competitive so it, it's it's not being arrogant. It's 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 real. Yeah. Well, and that goes back to again. I think you talk about implementing it, having the right people in the right seats, having those open minds to put it to work, and then want want to learn that that skill. Um. So I think we're just about done. But I wanted thank you first of all for for coming on and kind of talking through the history benchmark. It's truly fascinating. And we went from one location here in Raleigh to another location in Concord. So now we've got. Raleigh, Concord, Chesapeake, Ashland, and Roanoke, Virginia. So, I mean, quite the expansion. So, if you are anywhere in those areas, I think you you did a pretty good job, and we'll say the team. But the team, I mean, picking locations that were within two to two and a half hours of any part within those two states. So, um, it's not been by accident that we picked those locations. Um, it's, it's, it's neat to talk about the growth and kind of where we started. So, thank you for taking some time. You're welcome, and we're, you know, we're, I think over the next few months we'll be – um, releasing details on further expansion. And, I mean, we're just excited, but uh, we're trying to do it in a uh, manageable approach. Yeah. And, again, when we take that next step, it's going to take, you know, different skill sets and uh, resources to do so. But we're, we're extremely excited cool. for where we're headed. And so before we finish, I wanted to talk about one last kind of addition that we brought on. Obviously, we've been talking construction and surveying and machine control. Uh, but just recently, if anybody's been paying attention, they've noticed a shift, and we've gotten into sports surf and landscaping. Why now? What's what's been the draw? Um, I mean, there's obviously some correlation, but why now? Um, well, the the sports turf and well, athletic fields in general, mm-hmm. the the uh, labor 
issue is, is dominant there as well. And the, these technologies have become more affordable over the years so and, and easier to use yeah. and, and implement. So we've brought on a couple different uh, manufacturers that uh, produce, you know, autonomous sports field line painting machines. And, uh, it, I mean, it reduces the, the number of staff needed to accomplish that task mm-hmm. and where it would take, uh, you know, traditionally two years, three years, or excuse me, sorry, where it would traditionally take two to three hours to paint, say, a soccer field mm-hmm. with two to three guys. We can do that with technology now in, in less than 15 minutes with one person. So uh, the person's just basically there to observe to make sure they're, their robot is, is doing the job for them sure. accurately and efficiently. Um, so, again, the centerpiece of that is GPS or robotic technology. So we're using the same sensors, just different language on the interface. Yep. And in most cases, a different interface. So we're controlling all this stuff with an iPad now. So it just makes u- utilization easier. Yep. And, again, with us having that GPS knowledge, if you've got somebody in sports turf or, or landscape, you may not – quote, understand or new to it, again, we've got the person in the right seat to teach that willing person. I, I keep going back to that. I feel like I'm being a dead horse, but that's the most important part of this, I think, is is that. So, all right. So, Chuck, any any final words that you you want to share about the growth of benchmark and kind of where you see us going in the future? No, I mean, I just like to leave it. It's, it there's always challenges out there. Um, but if you're willing to change, adapt, and overcome, it's, it, it's fun in the end. So, we're we're extremely excited to to see these industries explode. Which uh, I mean, folks around here on the team get tired of me <laughs> stating the word potential, but it's it's to a point now where we, we it, it's so much potential. We're just uh, we've got to really focus on our niches and and go go tackle them. Yeah, very cool. Well, Chuck, again, thank you so much. Certainly appreciate you taking some time. Uh, I'm gonna have a second shorter podcast with Chuck here. We're gonna. Have cut this one and we're going to go straight to it. We're going to talk about maybe two to three minutes of some of those new technologies that we've brought on the past few years because it's very exciting. Hope you guys check that next one out. Um, As John would say, you've been benched in. Thank (laughs) y'all.